Don't want to be just like you. That's not how it sounds, but I bet you they'll be sounding like that. Let's talk about some very difficult realities. Not every band that deserves to make it big actually does. History is littered with artists that had all the right elements, but never quite made it to the very top. And unfortunately, history only seems to remember the winners. However, we are fortunate enough to live in a world where we can dig up the past and appreciate it based on its own merits. And one such example is the fondly remembered early aughts pop punk band Midtown. And why am I talking about Midtown? Because this week, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of their awesome sophomore release, Living Well is the Best Revenge. If you were not into pop punk during the early years of the century, it's likely that you have no idea who they are. Or if you were into the genre, you might not have thought about them for a long while. Whatever the case may be, Midtown is a band that's held up over the years. And it's time, it's time to give them their due. But before we get into the album, let's dive a little bit into their history. While the band is a complete unit, most of the attention they have received in the past two decades has focused on singer and bassist Gabe Saporta. Not only was Saporta a great frontman for Midtown, but he's gone on to have success outside of the band, like a ton of success in multiple avenues. You know, people really used to think that a lot of these pop punkers were in the business just to land other more glamorous gigs. And in some cases, they're probably right. But few have managed to parlay their pop punk success into opening for Bieber. That is like a whole different level of getting it done. But it's a misconception to say that the band was just supportive. All four young men really contributed to this band, and they built up a nice following in the Northeast in the early 2000s. That following led them to sign with Drive Thru Records. Now, I don't know about you, but there's two bands I think of when I think of Drive Thru Records. I think of Newfound Glory, because obviously, and I think of Midtown. In early 2000, the band would release their debut, Save the World, Lose the Girl. The album would be pretty well received, and they even put out the single for Just Rock and Roll. Personally, that's how I heard about this band. I saw that video on the Punk Broadcasting System compilation. I think I had it on VHS. That was like a hot topic stable. I should probably review that VHS in the future. wonder if I can find it. And in late 2001, they would begin work on this thing. Now, what I'm going to talk about next is a bit of a touchy subject, I know, and I'm not entirely clear on the timeline, so I'm really just going to give the Cliff Notes version of this. But by all indications... There was a major rift between Drive Through and Midtown at this point. Now, from what I can gather, the feud, at least from Midtown's perspective, boils down to the fact that the band did not feel they were treated properly by the label. They alleged things like lack of compensation, lack of attention, and creative differences. And it's safe to say this got ugly really, really quick. A lot of this documentation still exists online. Go check it out. It's actually a pretty interesting read 20 years later. And with all this, I think you have to remember the context that at this time, drive through was a subsidiary of MCA Records. And there was this transition phase that was going on where MCA could really pick up the drive through bands. And if you read the interviews by Midtown at this time, they were actually relieved to be going to MCA to be out of drive through Again, I don't know exactly who was right or wrong in this situation, but these two sides were definitely not getting along. Talk about irreconcilable differences. Through a whole bunch of litigation, Midtown would actually find themselves free from drive through and their next album would be released on Columbia Records. But the band really didn't last that much longer after that. In 2005, they decided to call it quits, and every member went on to do successful things within the music business. But their story didn't end there. They would actually reunite in 2014 for a show at the Skate and Surf Festival in New Jersey. And if you're going to go check out the much-anticipated My Chemical Romance reunion, you might also see the slightly less-anticipated Midtown reunion. I don't know, though. I kind of want, like, a ticket where I just pay to see Midtown and then I can leave and I can get con for the rest of the time. I got nothing against my Campbell Romance. I just, I think I'd rather see Midtown on a reunion. I'll catch the YouTube feed of my Campbell Romance. I'll catch the YouTube feed of my Campbell Romance. That's how you mess up a joke. What the hell are you talking about? As I was jumping back into this album in the last couple of weeks, I just kept kind of thinking, why didn't Midtown get bigger? Why didn't they blow up like their contemporaries? They were right there with all these bands that became big pop stars. Why didn't it happen for Midtown as a band? Again, one of their individuals definitely became a pop star. But why didn't it happen for Midtown? Well, I think there's a few reasons that I've kind of looked at. And these are going to come across really, really critical, what I'm about to say. 
but I think you should take it with a grain of salt. These are just some things that I noticed that may have hindered them. And again, as I noted before, there was a lot going on with this band. So who knows if there was other things that were in the way. All I really have to go on is just the music. What else is there? So with that said, let's take a look at some possible explanations of why Midtown didn't quite blow up the way they could have. The first reason that I've identified was a lack of a big hook on this album. Don't get me wrong, this album is extremely poppy and catchy throughout. But I kind of feel like I don't hear that one big earworm in it. The one thing that'll get you to just chant along on the radio. And as we all know, pop punk is notorious for the great hooks. I don't think punk rock in general gets the credit for their songwriters writing such great hooks year in and year out. But I'll be honest, I kind of don't hear it on this thing. To further explain what I mean, think of how like the chorus to the anthem by Good Charlotte or the rock show by Blink-182, they just become embedded in your brain. I bet to this day, you could be in any pickup line at an elementary school or a middle school and there'd be a bunch of moms over there and you put on the anthem and those moms will be shouting out, don't want to be just like you. That's not how it sounds, but I bet you they'll be sounding like that. Maybe better, maybe worse. What the hell is that? The point is, those songs are kind of embedded. I don't know if I heard a song on this album that has that same kind of effect. Again, not to say they're not catchy, just that one piece that you could really go along with. Reason number two. This album might have felt a little dated, even in 2002. Let me explain this a little bit. I've talked about this somewhat in my Offspring video and my Green Day video, in that pop punk and 90s alternative, they are very much interrelated. Yeah, I get it, pop punk is kind of a form of alternative, but again, we've got to go back to definitions and all that, and I'm tired. I don't feel like doing that. The point is, they're very closely related. But, at the turn of the century, it really felt like pop punk became a new thing, something that was different than alternative rock. A lot of those alternative bands, I think you can almost categorize them as pop punk, but the bands that really blew up post-2000, they separated themselves from that. Of course, a lot of them would go back to that sound, but at that point, that really wasn't what was happening. But at the same time, it's only natural that bands from this era would be influenced by what was popular in the mainstream not that long ago. Take a look at a band like Sugar Cult. I think they're a good example of a band that borrowed a lot from the 90s alternative. That whole last reason wasn't well thought out. It sounded better in my head. When I'm listening to this album, that reason sounds better. It doesn't really hold up to even my own scrutiny as I'm making this video. And finally, not enough differentiation. Now this is going to be a strange criticism, but just bear with me for a minute. I'm losing my patience. So check this out. Midtown is as good as any pop punk band. And maybe that was the problem. They were just as good as any other pop punk band. If you wanted to create perfect pop punk, it would probably sound like Midtown. But the problem with that is it doesn't really stick out from its peers. So maybe it doesn't get noticed. Maybe it's not the squeakiest wheel that's getting the grease here. Again, I don't fault them for making music the way that they did. It was genuine. It feels real coming from them. But you could see that as being something that prevented them from truly, truly taking off. They don't really have like a thing or a gimmick. They are just straight up solid. And again, nothing wrong with that. But you can see how that might have been a hindrance. So those are the criticisms. And as I said, some of them are a little thin. But enough with all that noise. Let's talk about why this album's pretty awesome. It's about damn time. All great pop punk bands have great lyrics and Midtown is no exception. And you could appreciate how they have a lot of the pop punk cliches, but they express them slightly different. Yeah, I know they, that kind of contradicts the earlier criticism that they didn't stand out, but I think those differences are just a little more subtle. That doesn't make sense. In particular, I think the opening track lyrically really sets the tone here. So much of pop punk is focused on that anxiety that is growing up, but so few songs have really got down to the true id of what's really the issue. Like a movie also goes down the tried and true path of the pop punk song about a troubled female, and they pull it off pretty nice. Also, that song kind of makes me want to take back my opinion that they didn't have any hooks on this album. In the songs is also a nice take on the We Made It concept. There was a lot of those on pop punk albums back in the day, and I think there still is. And it's always going to work. It's always cool to hear like a story of us against the world. Yeah. 
This league mostly relies on the band's pop sensibilities, but there's moments when the band can really turn up the heat, and they do an excellent job of turning up said heat. You can contrast this with this. And finally, the listener is never bored throughout this entire album. Let's face it, we all have short attention spans. And they weren't this bad in 2002, they're getting worse, but they've been bad for a while. Okay, but I think enough. it's because of those things I've mentioned, like the range, like the lyrics, and Gabe's voice, that really keeps you drawn in. You never feel like this album is meandering, it's always getting to a point. And that's Living Well is the Best Revenge by Midtown, a classic that hopefully gets its respect. What are your thoughts on this album and Midtown in general? Are you going to go see them on the reunion tour? Have you been listening to them for 20 years? Sound off down below in the comment section, and I'll talk to you next time.